All right, so I'm going to try to do both sides of the room here. Um, so I'll come out in a little bit. So my name is Anton McCaffrey. I'm at uh, TriLink Biotechnologies. So we're a contract manufacturer um, for messenger RNA. We're the first ones and um, probably have the most experience with that. And today I'd like to tell you a little bit about some design considerations, take you all the way from the very beginning when you're thinking about developing your therapeutic, all the way towards the end when you're doing, wanting to do GMP manufacturing. Okay, so what does TriLink do? So we've been around for about 23 years. We started off specializing in highly modified nucleic acids. Um, we also make modified NTPs. It'll become important a little bit later on. But about eight years ago, we started doing manufacturing of messenger RNA therapeutics. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to tell you about today uh, and finish up with a little bit about CGMP manufacturing. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, mRNA applications, why you would want to use mRNA, um, you know, how do you go about making it, what's the process, what's the stability, um, what kind of quality control you want to do at the end, and then, um, you know, timelines for getting into the clinic. All right, so... Uh, mRNAs are popular for a bunch of different applications. One that you've hear, heard a lot about at this conference is genome editing uh, with CRISPR-Cas9 or Talons or zinc fingers. People also use this for gene replacement. And then there's a lot of applications in immunobiology. So, for example, making CAR T cells using CRISPR and things like that. Um, a lot of vaccine development in this area. It's very uh, uh, interesting. Personalized vaccines for your particular cancer because um, mRNA allows for very rapid development and manufacturing. Um, and then also self-replicating RNAs um, like alpha viruses that are popular for vaccines. All right, so why use messenger RNA? So really this comes out of something that came out of the society a long time ago, a trial um, with SCID with the lentivirus where we, uh, you know, they cured the bubble boy disease. Uh, but then the children went on to develop leukemia because they uh, had an insertion immunogenesis or insertion in front of the LMO gene, which was a proto-oncogene. And this caused concerns about DNA insertion. And so um, that one of the major benefits of mRNA is that you don't really have the risk of DNA insertion because it's an mRNA, right? Also, um, plasmids and viral vectors can elicit innate immune responses and adaptive immune responses. And then another advantage of uh, messenger RNAs is that plasmids and viruses need to get into the nucleus in order to be functional, whereas the target for the messenger RNA is the cytoplasm. So we only have to cross one barrier, one instead of two. And so messenger RNAs are particularly useful for uh, cell types that are hard to transfect. And then there's some other you know, applications like CRISPR-Cas9 or zinc fingers, that kind of thing, talons, that benefit from a transient expression. All right, so how do you design your messenger RNA? So um, the first step is design of a template that you use for transcription. Then you do an in vitro transcription, um, and that usually is followed by a DNA step. You can do post-transcriptional modifications like enzymatic capping or polyadenylation. Then you have to purify the RNA, and that's probably the most challenging step. Um, you can have optional things like phosphatase treatments and repurification. And then you have in-process assays um, that you do for safety, you do sterile filtration, and then final fill and release. <coughs> All right, so this is what a typical plasmid backbone looks like. You have a T7 promoter that drives transcription. Then you have untranslated regions, a 5' prime and 3' prime untranslated region that are here. You probably want um, an endotoxin-free plasmid. Um, you should avoid ampicillin as a, a selectable marker, so people typically use canamycin or others. Uh, epitope tags are frequently included in uh, you know, gene therapy um, preclinical things because they're easy to track, but these can uh, actually you know, elicit immunity, and so you want to avoid epitope tags in your final you know, drug. And then um, there's some debate about whether or not your plasmid needs to be GMP, but a lot of people think that really uh, that that's an important starting material. So people frequently will use a GMP grade plasmid, and you have to think about cell banking. And cell banking your plasmid can take a long time. And so a lot of people don't think about this in advance, is that you need to get this lined up before you, you know, get into the mRNA clinical development, because that may take you know, a year or more in order to get that going. So consider plasmid sourcing early. All right, so the ingredients of a transcription are very simple. So we have T7 polymerase, we have a transcription template, we have NTPs, and those can be modified, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a moment. 
Um, and then you have uh, optionally a cap analog, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second too. Uh, there's inorganic pyrophosphatase, which makes the reaction more efficient, and then usually you include an RNase inhibitor. So one of the important considerations for messenger RNAs is that the, the body perceives nucleic acids that are coming from the outside as being foreign. And so there are sensors such as toll-like receptors that are in endosomes. There's also a set of cytosolic sensors that are looking for messenger RNAs or RNAs that don't look like self-RNAs. Right? So we have, for example, PKR and MDA5 are looking for double-stranded RNA. Um, there's IFIT proteins that are looking for improperly capped RNAs that maybe look like a virus. And then there's a uh, C-gas sting, which is looking for DNA ends, which shouldn't be in the cytoplasm of itself. All right, so how do we avoid tickling these receptors? So there are a number of strategies that I'm going to talk about today. So the first one is you could do chemical modification of your messenger RNA. So messenger RNAs contain modified bases, such as pseudouridine and M6A. And so um, you can chemically modify your RNA to make it look more like a self-RNA. Um, you can do sequence optimization to uh, reduce the immunogenicity of your RNA. Um, you can use endogenous cap structures. I'll tell you a little bit more in just a minute about it, one called CAP1. And then you can purify your RNA to try to remove double-stranded RNA that's made inevitably during the T7 transcription process. All right, so modified nucleotides. So uh, really this field was started off by someone named Caitlin Curico, who um, had some early papers that suggested that if she fully modified an RNA with pseudouridine, now your RNAs usually have just little sporadic pseudouridines that are site specific, but you can fully modify your RNA with pseudouridine, and she showed that that reduced binding to innate immune receptors reduce the toxicity and increase the expression of the RNA. And so some popular modifications that people use are pseudouridine, N1-methyl pseudouridine, and 5-methoxyuridine. And I'll tell you a little bit more about some of those today. Okay, so first um, kind of point that I want to make, and you don't have to really worry too much about what these are, but this is a series of different cell lines here um, with different modifications that are shown here. And the only point I want to point out here today is simply that if you take a sequence context, which is EGFP, and one that's luciferase, that you see that these two patterns are different. Okay, so that tells you that primary sequence matters, and so that if you're going to optimize your construct, I would suggest that you do that in the context of your particular open reading frame and not necessarily a reporter. A reporter is really useful for determining, is my transfection efficiency good, things like that. But in terms of like, chemical modifications, you probably want to do that in the sequence context of your particular um, open reading frame of interest. So another thing that we found to be useful is sequence optimization. So uh, things like toll-like receptors recognize stretches of use. Um, so we found kind of empirically that if we take an open reading frame and we use codon uh, optimization, and you just take any synonymous codon where you can replace a U with another um, letter without changing the protein sequence, that that can increase activity. So you can see here, for example, for wild type or pseudo U modified RNAs, that sequence optimization improves the activity for those. And then there's a series of, of U modifications here that showed no activity in the original sequence context. But upon uridine depletion, we see that we actually get good activity with all of them one that you're going to hear a little bit more about later on is 5-methoxyuridine. So it didn't work at all in the non-U depleted context, and it works quite well after de U depletion. So sequence optimization is one of the things that you can do in order to improve the activity of your messenger RNA. All right, so conclusions for this is that innate immune activation is an important variable that I think you need to think about, and primary sequence matters, and so you should do it in the context of your sequence. So in numerous sequence contexts, we found that uridine depletion improves the activity and allows the use of 5-methoxyuridine. You'll see why that's important in a moment. And something I didn't show you any data about, but I think is another important consideration, is that the route of administration matters. So for example, if you're doing a lipid nanoparticle, you're probably trafficking through the endosome, and you're going to see toll-like receptors. If you're doing electroporation, you're probably not going to see toll-like receptors in the endosome. If you're doing it in vivo, it's a whole other set of, of uh, you know, things to think about. So the, rate, the route of administration matters. Um, and so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, 
So I'm going to shift gears right now and tell you a little bit about mRNA capping. <clears throat> so all eukaryotic messages or higher eukaryotes um, have a cap structure that looks like this. So you're used to hearing about a 7-methyl G cap, which is this. But the other important feature is that at the first sugar, there's a 2 primal methyl group here. And we call that cap 1. Okay? So if there's an OH there, then it, it's a virus and it's cap 0. But we, we want to achieve a cap 1 structure because that's what all eukaryotic messages have. There's a couple different ways that you can get to capping of your messenger RNA. It really, they fall into two different buckets. The first bucket is that you can do enzymatic capping. That can be highly efficient, um, but it's expensive, and it can be incomplete if you have a structured 5' prime end. And then there's uh, cap analogs, and I'll show you one in a second. Traditionally, people have used one called anti-reverse cap analog, or ARCA, and um, that gives you uh, inefficient capping and the yield is low, and I'll tell you in a second really why that is. So this is what ARCA looks like. So we're capping with a dimer. So normally T7 starts with a G right here. And instead what you do is you put an excess, usually a fourfold excess of this cap analog, and then these two compete for, with each other for initiation. And as a result, you know, because you're starving the reaction for GTP in order to get high levels of capping, that reduces the yield of your, cap, of your capping reaction. And another important thing is that this is going to give you a cap zero structure and not a cap one structure. So to overcome this, we came up with an approach that we called clean cap. And so clean cap, we initiate with a trimer instead of a dimer. And what we do is we choose a, a nucleotide at the beginning that T7 doesn't like to initiate with. So it doesn't like to initiate with A, right? But we're not initiating with A, we're initiating with AG. And so um, this binds much more efficiently than a single nucleotide. And so we're able to actually use an excess of GTP over the cap analog. Now, the cap analog is by far the most expensive thing in the reaction. Okay? And so we're also able to get about 2.5 times the yield. If you talk to anybody in a late-stage clinical program, the cost of goods is a real important driver of whether your drug is going to be successful. And so improving the yield and improving the capping um, is important for driving down your cost of goods. Okay? So we like this, we call this clean cap. Gives you a cap one structure with the methyl group there. So we developed the capping assay that we use um, to assay capping. It's an important uh, quality attribute of your messenger RNA. And the way we do this is basically we lop off the end of the message because sometimes we're making messages as long as 16,000 bases long. And then we measure this by LCMS this is what ARCA looks like. We're looking at just the end of the RNA. This is the cap form right there. That's the uncapped right there. So we're getting about 70% capping, and you can see that there's all this kind of transcriptional stuttering going on. In the case of enzymatic capping, this can go to completion. However, it doesn't always go to completion, and it really depends on the structure of the 5' prime end of your RNA. And so here I'm showing you an example where we have some of the intermediates in this capping reaction. So and no 7-methyl-G or cap zero. And so enzymatic capping doesn't always go to completion. And then on the right, you can see clean cap. This is the cap material. That right there is the uncapped material. It's something capping in the in mid-90s to high-90s. Okay? So we like cap, we like clean cap. All right, so um, kind of summarize this section. Cap zero is recognized as foreign. Um, there's these proteins called IFITs that bind cap zero structures and they sequester the cap RNA from the uh, translation initiation machinery and prevent it from being translated. So cap one, um, it reduces binding to pattern recognition recept receptors, um, such as PKR and Reg I, and so it licenses the RNA as a self RNA, and so there reduces uh, in stimulation of innate immunity. And we know something's important about cap one because most cytoplasmic RNA viruses encode a methyl transferase that makes a cap one. Or some viruses steal a cap in the process called cap snatching in order to have a cap one structure. If you block this methyl transferase activity in the virus, you end up with an attenuated virus. And so this strongly suggests that cap one is a determinant of self and non-self in the cell. So we think that it's important to have a cap one structure. 
So this is just a little bit of in vivo data. So this is um, lipid nanoparticle formulated messenger RNA that is either CAP0 or CAP1. Uh, so this was in collaboration with Arcturus Therapeutics. They formulated the RNAs. We de deliver them to the liver of the mouse. And this is just the activity. And what you can see is that at early times, CAP1 is better than CAP0. Here we're showing you wild type HPLC or 5-methoxyuridine modified RNA. Again, 5-methoxyuridine is to reduce innate immune stimulation. You can see at late times, basically CAP0 is similar to the PBS control, and that CAP1 structure is giving you activity here. All right, so in vivo, suggesting that CAP1 is superior to CAP0. So you can get there either by enzymatic capping or by um, using clean cap. Okay, so the conclusions here is that enzymatic capping is uh, efficient, but it's also one of the more expensive parts of the process if you're going to go that route. So CAP1 licenses RNAs as self-RNAs, and ARCA, which is kind of the legacy CAP analog, yields a CAP0 structure, which we think is not very good in vivo. So in immortalized cell lines, you may not see a big difference between CAP0 and CAP1. However, in vivo, at least in the liver, we think that this is important. Um, so clean cap yields a CAP1 structure. It's highly efficient in capping and um, gives higher yields than ARCA. Um, and then in mouse liver, we showed that CAP0 is inferior to CAP1. Okay. So switching gears to the next portion of the RNA. So messenger RNAs have a three prime uh, poly A region that is a clock for stability. So you bind poly A binding pr protein on the um, poly A tail, cap binding protein on your cap. These come together and translation initiates. And so it's important to have a poly A tail. And you can do that in a couple different ways. So you can encode a poly A tail in your plasmid. Um, and then during transcription, you just make that poly A or you can uh, add the poly A enzymatically, right? So it seems like a no-brainer. You'd want to do the plasmid, right? Um, because then you don't have an additional step, but there's a little bit of a catch, and that is that bacteria don't support long stretches of poly A's within a plasmid. So we found 80 to be uh, relatively stable. When we try to go to longer poly A's, what we find is we get recombination events. You don't want recombination in your plasmid template for a clinical material, right? So um, we usually, for uh, GMP, use a plasmid with an 80 base poly A tail. If you want more poly A, um, you can add that with poly A polymerase. However, poly A polymerase is also one of the most expensive parts of the synthesis. And so um, it's kind of a cost benefit. You may get a little bit more activity, but then you're going to increase your cost of goods. Up to you. We do it both ways. Okay. Um, so, I think I already told you most of this, so, it, um, so long poly A tails can be added with poly A polymerase, um, but you're going to get a distribution of different poly A tail lengths. And you're going to have to establish conditions where you get a reproducible poly A tail in each batch to batch. Right? Um, and you can assess that using a really simple assay that we developed. Basically, we run the pre-poly A and the post-poly A on a, on a bioanalyzer, a tape station, and you can make an estimate of the average distribution of these two and then basically look at the difference. That is not the exact number of, of A's there. That's simply an estimate. And so the assay is relatively reproducible. We're not claiming that it's exactly 448 nucleotides. It's simply an assay you can use to see, am I getting reproducible polyadenylation? So it's more qualitative than quantitative. OK, so switching gears now again to purification. So this is the hardest part. So at TriLink, we make RNAs at multi-gram scales, basically you know, beakers full of enzymes you know, into a transcription reactions, you know, multi multiple liters. It's easy to scale that. Imagine that you can make kilograms of RNA actually fairly in a fairly trivial manner. But purifying a kilogram of RNA is not a trivial thing to do. Okay? And we're still learning how to do this, right? So we're trying to remove the impurities that we don't want in the, re in the reaction. So it's the components, it's the salts, the NTPs, the cap, you know, analogs that's left over that wasn't incorporated, you know, potentially trunc truncated products. We do a DNA treatment of the DNA, but there's still small DNA fragments. We want to remove all these different things. So at TriLink, we've done a couple different approaches to this. Um, so, you know, a traditional approach is to use, say, an RNEasy 
kind of approach, which is a silica membrane. However, this is not scalable. You can make about a gram that way, and that's about it. Um, so we've developed a couple different ways to do this. The first one we call LC isolation. That basically removes the salts, the NTPs, and things like that. But it doesn't do anything to remove the double-stranded RNA. For some applications, like a vaccine, that might be just fine, right? So in a vaccine, the mRNA or the double-stranded RNA can actually act as an adjuvant for your vaccine, and that could be a good thing, right? Um, if you're making, you know, doing protein replacement, then you probably want a more rigorous purification. And so for that, we developed a, a reverse phase-based method that uh, removes double-stranded RNA. That works great for things up to about 4 kb. People in the room may be aware that Cas9 is about 4.5. That's about where things start getting difficult. Okay? Um, we're still work on it, working on it. It's a work in progress. This is what it looks like for a short sequence. So in the uh, red is the purified, and the blue is the original. You can see that we're purifying. We're getting rid of some of the junk at the beginning, the front, and the back. Um, we think that the double-stranded RNA comes out towards the back. Um, and so this is an example of what a reverse phase purification of a short transcript looks like. I believe this was luciferase. We also um, use a slot blot with an antibody that's specific for double-stranded RNA to look at depletion of the double-stranded RNA during the purification. So we're probing, we're putting the RNA onto a membrane and then we're probing with this double-stranded uh, specific antibody. And you can see here for wild type or pseudo-U that we can deplete the RNA of double-stranded RNA, but we don't get rid of it completely. And so we're still working on developing more methods that work better at this. This is an ongoing process. All right, but this might be another one of your sort of release assays for your messenger RNA as you go along. All right, so this is a little bit of cell data, and the reason why I'm showing this is to illustrate a point about 5-methoxyuridine. So if you look at the white bars versus the um, dark bars, which are HPLC, you can see for wild-type and pseudouridine that HPLC improves the activity of the RNA, right? But for 5-methoxyuridine, we don't see a benefit from HPLC purification. And when we look at an interferon response in a, a THP1 uh, dual assay, um, which is a, a macrophage-like cell line, um, we see that in the HPLC decreases the interferon activity for the wild type and the pseudouridine modified RNAs but there's no interferon induction for the unpurified RNA with 5-methoxyuridine. We don't know exactly why that is, but we hypothesize that the double-stranded RNA that's formed in a 5-methoxyuridine transcription is not recognized by the pattern recognition receptors like PKR or MDA5 that are recognizing double-stranded RNA. Now, this is a real advantage in that I told you that the bottleneck for doing messenger RNAs is HPLC purification. So if you don't have to do HPLC purification, you sell, save yourself a buttload of money and uh, a lot of time. And so you should consider if, that if you can use 5-methoxyuridine. Now, we know that not all sequence contexts allow the use of 5-methoxyuridine, and so you need to establish that for your particular construct. But if you can avoid spending you know, millions of dollars on HPLC purification and adding months to your process, you probably want to contemplate that. All right, so the conclusions here is that we have an LC isolation method that's good at getting rid of kind of the process impurities, but not necessarily the double-stranded RNA. And if you want to remove the double-stranded RNA, you need some kind of a purification process, such as reverse phase um, purification. Um, and the other thing you want to think about is that when you're considering your, your synthesis scale, you have to allow for the fact that your yield off of HPLC purification, for example, might be 30%. And so you need to have your scale being appropriate to the fact that if you're going to do a purification, you're going to throw away a bunch of good stuff. and A lot of the bad stuff, you're probably going to end up 50% might be really optimistic. All right. So last part is just sort of planning um, and timelines if you're ready to go to the clinic. So at TriLink, we have a GMP manufacturing facility for messenger RNA. We were the first contract manufacturer to have a, um, a GMP facility in this. Um, and so this is kind of what a timeline looks like for developing a program. So um, it takes, you know, depending on the scale, 1 to 16 hours for the plasmid linearization. Takes, usually we do the transcription for 1 to 3 hours. DNA is, is uh, fairly uh, quick. At large scale, we usually do a diafiltration. The time that that takes um, depends on the scale as well. Um, and then uh, you can have an HPLC purification in there if you desire. Um, that can take 
you know, hours to days or even months if you're going to purify, you know, multigram amounts. And then there's another diafiltration and then final QC. So currently we're manufacturing at, uh, you know, scales of uh, micrograms to multigrams, but it should be easily feasible to synthesize kilograms of messenger RNAs. Um, and the process has been sort of developing as the needs of our clients have developed. And so we've been advancing and moving to higher scales as kind of as the uh, industry has demanded of us. Um, and that, you know, there's innovations and tools and techniques and uh, upstream uh, strategies for manufacturing biology. Generally, those are keeping pace with the mRNA manufacturing requirements. So in terms of final process release assays, these are some of the ones that we offer. The ones on the left are kind of more specific to a messenger RNA. They're things like capping efficiency, double-stranded RNA, poly A tail length. Residual proteins are important, you know, residual DNA, um, the concentration of the RNA. And then there's a bunch of ones that are relatively standard, you know, in the drug field, you know, of identity, purity, endotoxin, sterility, all those kinds of things. One thing to keep in mind is that for some of these assays, if you're going to do a USP assay, you may actually use more of RNA for your um, you know, bio burden and endotoxin than you would use for a, you know, a trial for a small number of patients. And so you need to factor in that you're going to have to plan on having material for your QC. And sometimes those USP assays were designed for you know, drugs other than messenger RNAs, and they're not really realistic in terms of the volumes and things like that. Um, but, you know, the assay really is up to you. We don't tell you what the specification for your drug is because it's going to be different for a vaccine in a healthy child versus, you know, a, a cancer patient that has one year, you know, one month left to live. And so you guys tell us what specification you need to meet for the FDA, um, but we can help you with assays to try to determine whether that's realistic and, you know, and can you meet that reproducibly over and over and over. All right, so the last little bit is about stability of RNA. So people think of RNA as being kind of sort of a fragile thing, but in the absence of metals or RNAs, you know, from a chemical perspective, RNA is a very stable molecule. And so you just have to keep it clean and, and treat it nicely. And so, you know, without RNAs there or metals, it's actually, you know, can, you can go through 10 freeze-thaw cycles without, you know, seeing a, you know, a real drop in quality you know, people lyophilize RNAs and they can be stored at room temperature for, you know, extended periods of time. Um, and so, you know, it, it's relatively stable. But that said, you're probably going to want to do a stability study for your messenger RNA. This is just an example. Um, you know, all my slides will be available, you know, on our website. So don't worry too much about taking this down. But, um, you know, you want to be planning a stability study early because those take time, right? And so usually you're doing an accelerated stability at an elevated temperature. And then, you know, these studies of, at your storage temperature are going to take a longer time. So plan ahead that you need to have your stability study in place kind of as you're getting from your preclinical to your clinical part. All right. So just briefly. Um, we have a, a nice GMP facility um, at Trilink. Um, we're actually moving into another building um, in September that will have a larger facility, and so we're scaling as a community, you know, requires us to, to get bigger and bigger. Um, so please come and manufacture with us in our, in our GMP facility. And these are the people who helped with this work and some of our collaborators here on the right-hand side. And if you would like to learn more, you can learn more through sales at Trilink, or you can contact me at that email address and I would be happy to take any of your questions. All right, uh, questions. Looks like Kevin has one. Hi, Anton. Hey, Kevin. So um, you touched upon it, but the whole issue of metabolic stability of RNA, mRNA, has, uh, has Trilink come up with any nucleotide substitutions that increase the metabolic substitution? Uh, metabolic stability, but simultaneously retain transfection or, ex ex I would say, translation competency? Well, um, I think that the thing that is translated the best um, in the cell is wild-type RNA because that's its normal substrate. And so I think that adding these modified bases can actually reduce the innate translational, intrinsic translational potential. Um, but I think that the innate immune stimulation really wins. And so in an ideal world, you'd want to have a non-immunogenic wild-type RNA. Um, but I think that we're not quite there in terms of the purification to quite get there. But, but, but it really doesn't answer my question because 
Yeah, that's the ideal world. But in the ideal world, those mRNAs are actually produced inside of cells. You're producing them outside. Mm -hmm. You can purify them to this degree, but they still have to be formulated. And RNAs is the enemy, and it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a more metabolically stable molecule, I think, RNA, mRNA, just to be able to package it and deal with the metabolic stability issues. I mean, in a lipid nanoparticle, I think the RNA is relatively protected. And so if you have a clean lipid and you have a clean RNA, I think you, the, the packaging is not the problem. Um, you know, the, I just showed you data of a lipid nanoparticle formulated RNA that we delivered to the liver of my, you know, mice. So the stability in the lipid nanoparticle I don't think is an issue. The stability in the cell is something that's harder to regulate. You have a balance between you know, doing chemical modification and maintaining the translational potential. I think you can do things like have <clears> the capping. I didn't show you data today, but yeah. we've shown, for example, that an M6A cap has a longer stability in the cell, um, and that you can change the stability with the poly-A tail. But, but one last point, I guess, there is a, a, a difference between packaging and then in the cell. It's called the circulation. Mm -hmm. So in that process, there's where you lose a lot of your mRNA due to degradation. So Even in a lipid nanoparticle. Yes, they can yeah. be degraded uh, in serum as they circulate, taken up by cells and degraded and so forth. Yeah. So I think, you know, coming up with an analog that would be stable is key uh, to advance the field. Yeah, I mean, it also has to be incorporatable by T7 polymerase, and so that's another limitation. So, I mean, things like two plant floors and things like that, T7 doesn't accept those. Hi, uh, thank, you for, thank you very much, Anton, for these uh, lectures. Question about the long messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. uh, have you managed to make a reproducible production? And you know, when I mean long messenger RNA, like more than 10 KB, for example. Sure, it's yeah? actually really easy to make a long RNA. So I think the longest one that we've made is 16,000 bases. And yeah. they don't look like a you know, 2,000 base luciferase RNA, but you get a distinct band on the gel and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's actually easy to make them. What's hard is the processing part, and so every time you touch the RNA, it, it shears, and, and yeah. so every time you do a process to it, it degrades. Uh, so you mean when you are doing the process, uh, purification right. process? Right, and so, for and example, so if you do, you know, people traditionally do enzymatic capping of those RNAs, yeah. then you do a purification, so you do the transcription during a purification during which you degrade your RNA, and then you cap a, a sub-optimal you know, optimal RNA. That's actually one of the reasons we like clean cap, and it's actually been adopted a lot by people working on self-replicating RNAs, is that we've removed a step, and that really increases the, the integrity of the RNA. And so in an ideal world, I think you'd want a one-pot reaction followed by a very simple purification, and then And then no. that's it. OK, yeah. thank you so much. And you might accept an RNA that's less, you know, that's less pure in order to have it not. So, so if know, I understand, yeah. uh, 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 Producing small, I mean, small or longer one, uh, it's exactly the same in terms of scale, but the process of purification is, is difficult. I mean, I wouldn't say that you get the same level of quality huh? from a 16,000 base RNA that you do for a 1,000 base, but I mean, it's actually not that different, you okay. know, as you might. As Thank you. you. Might. The, the enzyme is fairly processive. Thanks. So just quick questions. We are over time, but please go ahead. Yeah. Quick one. Yeah. Uh, are there any design considerations for the five prime and three prime UTR regions flanking uh, the OR? Absolutely. So people do, um, you know, optimizations with their own open reading frames of five prime and three prime UTRs, and I think that you can get, act, you know, activity benefits of doing that. We're a contract manufacturer, so we make thousands of different message RNAs, so we don't optimize for each person's things. But people who do this for a living, you know, the Modernas of the world, or, you know, CureVac or BioNTech, they, they optimize their 5 prime and 3 prime ATR. Can you speak at all to the uh, sequence fidelity of the T7? And have, have you done any deep sequencing to, to know? Uh, no, you're fine. Go ahead. To know whether there's any error rate, because oh. that would affect, you know, clinical utility of these if a certain fraction of the mRNAs have yeah. unintended mutations. There's absolutely a fidelity rate of T7 polymerase. I think it's something around 10 to the, 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7th. Um, and uh, we haven't really looked at that directly, but I think that it, it's known in the literature that it has a certain fidelity, and, and that's... Just, I, I, I'm not, you know, you could evolve a, an enzyme perhaps that would have a higher fidelity, but uh, we, we're not in the business of enzyme evolution. All right, well, thanks, everybody. All right, thanks again for a great talk.